In this video, we'll start to learn how to find the volumes of solids of revolution. We'll start with a kind of special case where the axis of revolution is the x-axis. And we have some curve on a closed interval that does not intersect the x-axis. And we take this curve and rotate it around the x-axis and look for the volume of the resulting figure. Well, the resulting figure is going to be something thing like this kind of vase shaped and we certainly don't know any geometric formula that lets us find the volume of such a thing so as is our way in calculus when we are stumped by something, we ask ourselves, well, if we can't find the answer, can we approximate the answer? And if the answer to this question is yes, then can we use a limit to make our approximation exact. We've done this once before when we were looking at area under a curve. And the method we used involved cutting the interval into little pieces, what we call a partition. So let's look at this again. Let's partition the interval. And let's look at the curve on one of these little sub intervals in the partition. And let's try to approximate the volume. generated on this sub interval alone then we can repeat these this process with all of the other subintervals and add our approximations up. Well, if we take this little piece of the curve 
and rotate it around the x-axis. That's still not a figure whose volume we know. But let's remind ourselves how this worked when we were trying to approximate areas under curves. The method we used there was to select a point in the subinterval and use that point to create a rectangle and to approximate the curve with the top of the rectangle. That worked once. It's about to work again. So let's label some points. We'll call the start of this subinterval x sub i and the end of the subinterval x sub i plus one. So going back to this figure, we are labeling these values like so. Let's call this point O C sub I and running out of space a bit but we'll call the length of this subinterval delta x sub i. We used c sub i to create this rectangle. We started at zero and went up to the curve, went up to f of c sub i. So the height of this rectangle is f of c sub i. And we're using this rectangle to approximate approximate the curve. And the benefit of doing that is if we take this rectangle and rotate it around the axis, we get a shape we are familiar with. We get a cylinder. And the volume of a cylinder we know, or if we don't know it, we can look it up. It's the area of this circle squared times pi times the height of the cylinder. And in this case, let's draw in the x-axis, the radius is f of c sub i, and the height or the width, maybe I should say, is this distance. This is very much not drawn to scale. Delta x sub i. So our approximation of the volume using this rectangle 
rectangle is that the volume, just looking at this subinterval, is approximately pi times the radius of this cylinder squared times the height of this cylinder. And now going back to what I said earlier, now that we've seen how to approximate the volume on a little sub interval, to approximate the total volume, we take all of these approximations, we repeat this process on each of these intervals in turn, and we add them all up. And this approximation of the volume is a Riemann sum. And this approximation of the volume, I should emphasize it is just an approximation, but this approximation of the volume gets better the smaller these intervals get. So if we keep repeating this process with smaller and smaller approximations, sorry, with smaller and smaller intervals, our approximation gets better. And it becomes exact in the limiting case. We take the limit as the size of these subintervals all go to zero. of this sum. And we no longer have an approximate the equal sign here. This is exactly the volume. But this limit of a Riemann sum is precisely the definition of a definite integral. The A and B that appear here are the beginning and the end of the interval we're looking at. The integral from A to B of pi times f of x squared dx. And it doesn't strictly speaking matter. I suppose, but you can pull constants out of integrals. And this formula is traditionally written with the pi out here. 
So we've defined the formula for the volume of a solid of revolution. Or more properly speaking, we've found the formula for one special case where the axis of revolution happens to be the x-axis. As we proceed through this section, we'll see examples of this to begin with, but then we'll see how to modify this formula in the event that the axis of revolution is something else.